Hello and welcome to episode four of the Leading Minds podcast, uh, where on a weekly basis we bring in entrepreneurs to discuss different issues in and around mental health and the challenges that entrepreneurs face. Now on today's episode, we're gonna be touching on something we discussed in episode one, which was how we can get fooled into the facade of people that we think are successful and we don't necessarily know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and today we wanna put a spotlight on that fact where we can look at something or somebody and say, we wanna be like them, but we don't necessarily understand the journey that they've been through. And I can't think of a better example than our guest today. Model, actress, reality TV star, philanthropist, entrepreneur, producer, director, Dina, how are you? <laughs> That's such a nice introduction, I know. thank you. It's facts, <laughs> it's facts. Thank you very much for coming on. No, I'm really happy to be and here. I'm hoping that we can really cover topics that dig really deep into who you actually are away from the persona mm -hmm. that is is obviously shown online. So let's let's start off from, so that people get a bit of a background of, of who you are. Yeah. So, what would you think i mean all these things that i've gone over which what do you think is probably the the one that kind of put you into the spotlight the most yeah in terms of um i think the most tv time i've had and people when people really got to see the most of me i guess that's when i started my uh, reality tv shows when i went on to big brother in 2012 um that was, you know, I was living in the house with cameras everywhere, like 24 seven, and I was in there for two and a half months. So that's when people really got to know like who I am or they became aware of me. Um, and then I did a few other TV shows after that. So I think, yeah, that was the main thing that put me in the limelight. So Big Brother just excelled you, right? Yeah, like into, I was modeling and I was I had a business before that and um, I was doing photo shoots and fashion shows, but obviously it doesn't give you as much exposure as being on a reality TV show. So we're gonna come back to how that affected you because obviously that affected you quite considerably. Mm -hmm. But let's go right back to your beginnings. I mean, people may see this facade of you and they see this glamorous girl, but actually you're actually from quite humble beginnings, aren't you? Yeah, very humble actually. So um, I was born in a very small village called Broughton. It's near town Redcar, do you know Redcar? Cleveland. Yeah it's, yeah, it's kind of close to Middlesbrough. Yeah. But yeah, it's an extremely small village. I was born there. My mum's a single parent. So it was just me and my mum. I don't have any brothers or sisters. Um, so I grew up there and I was there until the age of, how old was I when I moved? Till 12? Yeah. And then um, at 12, I moved to the Midlands. I was in Birmingham. Um, yeah, so that's so that road to stardom. Yeah, actually, <laughs> was just the same as everybody else. Yeah, yeah, very humble beginnings. Um, it's, if you saw, if you Google the village where I'm from, yeah. you'd be shocked. Like very small population. It's um, there was no other um, ethnicities there. I was the only Indian in the village. Me and my mom. There was only like English people there. Um, so how did you so find that growing up? with regards from, from an ethnic perspective, or an ethnicity um, so perspective? So I always knew I was different um, to everyone else in a way, because obviously like, look, you could tell my mom's Indian with her skin tone and people did treat us differently. Um, my nickname in school was Brownie. Wow. So I, like, I knew from a young age, okay, I'm, I'm a bit different. But it was hard because there was no other Indians around me. So I wasn't like really sure about who I am. Like I thought growing up, like I'm a red Indian. <laughs> All I knew was I'm Indian. So I used to see Red Indians like on cartoons and I yeah. thought, oh, well, maybe I'm one of them because I wasn't around like anything in my culture. So I didn't really understand. And it was confusing because I would go to school and I would know different because my nickname would be Brownie. So it, it, was, it, was, yeah, it was difficult, actually. So, I mean, growing up and going through that, you must have kind of thought, well, this is the norm. This is what life, this is, what life is like. No, I always felt different. Really? Yeah, I felt that... Um, it wasn't a very nice childhood, to be honest. If, you know, like my mum was there for me, but I didn't have any other support. I didn't have um, any other family around to support. I didn't have an older brother. Um, so I had to become very independent from a young age and I had to learn how to be strong from a young age as well. So what's an example at that age where you felt, okay, you know what, I am actually on my own or I've, I, I feel like really independent. I've got to deal with 
X issue. Like in from like primary school, um, you know, it's strange because I remember from such a, a long way back. I remember in nursery, everything was fine. And nursery, like for tiny kids, yeah. kids don't judge, yeah, right? Yeah. They're, they're more innocent. They're innocent, that's the word, yeah. So I still remember my nursery days and they were my best days. I had a lot yeah. of friends. And then I went into uh, primary school and that's when things changed and all the friends that I had from nursery stopped talking to me in primary school. And I, I, I do feel like um, there was a lot of racism there and a lot of the kids' parents would tell them, okay, Dean is Indian and that would put something in their mind. So then from second year in primary school, like I remember I had no friends and I remember thinking like my friend was the sun. I'd go out and oh, I'd like wow. have chasing games with the sun and think that the sun is chasing me. Like that w I had like no friends at all. So at what and point did you feel growing up that you wanted to get into performing arts and, and wanted to go down that route? Um, so I always like used to watch TV and see pop stars and actors and I used to say to my mom I want to be a pop star when I'm older and then um, it was funny because I think in the second to last year in primary school I made friends with all the oddballs you know like the other kids that yeah. didn't have any friends and I put us all together and I said listen we should make a group and we should be yeah. friends together and um, and I made them all like perform with me and and do a little songs and yeah. do performing arts and stuff so from a young age i've always been into all that so what, what's your early memory of performing arts or, or doing something where you're the center of attention i think all the school plays i would make sure that i'm like the main yeah. person in the school play and um i would i would organize like um days where we'd perform in front of everyone and do like we pretend we're the Spice Girls I would always be Scary Spice or Sporty Spice I would get the <laughs> other girls to be the other Spice Girl yeah. and I would make us like uh, do shows and do it for people so from a young age I was really into that um, I did, was doing used to do a lot of karate as well my mum put me in karate like at six so I did karate for like 12 years well, my did that help you with your confidence your self confidence um, I think it taught me to be um, what's the word you know, if you if you want something, you really have to work hard to get it. Like yeah. my my mum would never let me have a day off. Um, my aim was to get my black belt. So even there was days, you know, I didn't want to go. I would force myself to go. So I think that taught me to be strong in life and just to. Um, so all these things in your childhood. Kind of, built the foundation for you to move forward mm. and be very strong in everything else that you would do in your life. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Looking back now, I think. So created yeah. pretty much the, the the foundation for you to excel. Yeah, yeah. Even coming from, like we said, humble beginnings, mm. you you were pretty you you were kind of set up to be very very strong in your future life. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's come back to before Big Brother. So you you got into modelling, mm -hmm. and you won Miss India UK. Is that right? Yeah. So tell us about that experience, because I think that was really the catalyst for what happened afterwards, right? So Miss India UK, that was in 2012. Um, I think at the time I had moved to Mumbai. Um, I didn't plan to be there for a long time. I just flew out there to shoot a music video yeah. and then my stay there just kept getting extended. Um, and then I came back for a quick break to UK and at the same time the competition was happening. So I thought, you know, why not try? I might as well. It wasn't yeah. really pre-planned. It was all a little bit last minute. So I entered and then the competition was like uh, a month later. Um, and um, I, I probably didn't take it too seriously. I just thought, you know, it's happening. We might as well try. I thought if I win the title, it'll be good for my career in India because people really like titles and miss this and miss that yeah, yeah. they like it over there so um yeah that was it basically i just took a chance and thought it's happening why not so before then you were obviously doing your modeling and you doing your uh, you were doing music videos and stuff like that yeah right? i was doing a few things so um i was studying marketing and pr at uh, university um at the same time yeah, i was doing my modeling i was doing a lot of promotional work i set up a small company so i was promo um, supplying promotional staff for companies um, I was organizing fashion shows. So I was doing quite a few things. Um, yeah. So w so was that the first time that you'd set up a, a, a business? Or yeah. did you have it in you always to, to try and do things outside of your, your modeling and your acting I think, career? you know, from a young age, my mum always taught me the importance of 
earning and the importance of money and yeah. I experienced it growing up because my mom wasn't working we didn't have a lot so I, I learned from a very young age the importance of like working and, working and hard earning. and yeah and having I knew that, that mindset and I, wa I wanted nice things in life I wanted to have a nice house and a nice car and whatever so I knew the only way to get this is by working um it would have been nice you know if I could have just concentrated on my studies fully but I didn't have that luxury and um, I probably spent more time working than studying. So so, uh, so up until that point, right? So we're just got, we're, we're trying to get an idea of just before Big Brother, just before it popped. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, you've been through these challenges, let's say, of where you lived and your surroundings. You've really had to work hard just to even achieve a normal life, let alone a yeah. life that other people would say, okay, yeah, that I'd, I'd want a part of that. So you really worked hard, had that work ethic to get to that point. And it kind of feels like that everything that happened from a negative perspective before kind of led you up to that point. Mm -hmm. So you've won Miss India UK, your profile's raised a bit, and then now you're about to go into Big Brother. Yeah, it all happened really fast, actually, in 2012. So I won the the title at the beginning of the year. Um, and I think about a month after that, I just went an audition for Big Brother. And then in the summertime, I got chosen and all that happened, yeah. How did you feel at that point? It's because I think back, this is back 2012, yeah. Big Brother was quite, it's a, it was a big thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like one of the biggest reality TV shows around. Yeah. So you must have felt, what, anxious, nervous, excited? You know, it's so excited. strange because I, I used to watch the show from a young age and I every time I used to watch the show, I just knew like when I apply, I'll get in. It's such really? a weird feeling. Yeah, it yeah. was like I wasn't nervous about it at all. And I knew um, when I go for the audition, like deep inside, I just knew I was going to get it. And I'm not really like an ultra confident person. I'm not, yeah. I wouldn't say I'm like big headed or anything, but with just that, I, I just knew I was gonna get it. So I wasn't even surprised. That desire that you, you wanted it just, to be. I don't know, it was just like a calm feeling that I, I knew really? if I go for it, I'll get in. Yeah. Yeah. So strange. you've gone through the process. Yeah. You're on Big Brother. Mm -hmm. That must have been a nerve wracking experience. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I don't think it really hit in until the moment that I was like walking into the house. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it happened really fast. Like, did you do the whole? You know, when the, w literally when you walk into the house and you got the crowd there, crowd here. Was it, was it Davina called? Uh, no, it was Brian it? Meyer. Okay, yeah. and so you're walking down. You got lights flashing on you. Like to me, that would be really intimidating i think that's like, the moment it hit me before yeah. that it never really sunk in like, and i was I'm, quite I'm, calm about it all um and then they chose me to be like the first person to enter the house and they gave me a task straight away so that's when it hit me i was like oh <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then i got into the house and i don't know i think i went in a bit naive i thought you know it's going to be so much fun i'll make friends in there everyone's going to be just relaxed and it's just gonna you know we were gonna do tasks it's gonna be a nice experience but as soon as i got in there and the contestants started coming in i'm like okay it's not gonna be what i thought because you could sense straight away like the people that they put in the house you, we're, you we're not gonna get along it's a, it's, a, it's a competition isn't it there's a prize at the end of it so see i wasn't thinking of it like that like i really i didn't do big brother for my career or to win I actually just did it because I thought it's a once in a lifetime experience mm -hmm. and it's going to be fun. I just did it because I thought it was going to be fun. But no one else that entered the house was thinking like that. They uh, all thought of it like a competition and um, they they didn't go in there to make friends or have fun. So how They went in there, they were, they were, <coughs> a lot of the people were very like, um, so if you go into Big Brother, you can't just have a normal conversation with someone, right? Because the person's always thinking there's the cameras yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So half the time you can't even speak to the other person. They don't let you say anything because they're so eager to keep speaking and speaking. So then they get airtime. Mm. So no conversation in that house is a normal conversation. But did it not get to a point where you, you kind of become oblivious to the cameras because you just get so used to them? Or was it really every day you knew they were at there? At the beginning, it like... It, you're aware that they're like even you go to the bathroom there's a toilet there's a oh, camera no. in front of you so the first three weeks that like, you're really aware and in the end you just stop caring like because you go through so much trauma in there yeah. and every week i was up for eviction yeah. and every single day like i'm having a, an argument sure. well it wasn't it wasn't even sorry, just that sorry yeah go on. it wasn't <laughs> even just that yeah 
it was probably one of the most controversial um, series of Big Brother because of the racism issues mm. that were involved that you were really involved in. Yeah. Um, getting nominated. How many times did you get nominated? So I broke the record of being the most nominated contestant in the history of Big Brother. I was up for eviction every single week. Like eight that, weeks in a row. from the start? Literally from the start of when they uh, From the eviction. second week, I was up for eviction every how, week. How, how quickly do you, would you say, well, going into the house, how would you say your, your mental state was? Would you say, I, I feel quite good, feel quite mentally strong? Yeah, I was good, I was strong. So and how? So from the experience, but that I think I went in there very naively, thinking it was going to be fun. <laughs> so from understanding that people are going in there with, I'd say, not the best intentions, like like you had. Yeah. How quickly did your mental health deteriorate? So I would say in the second week, it started getting really difficult because um, there was no one in there for me to speak to. Um, I would walk into a room and you can just feel the atmosphere that people don't like you and no one would actually say anything direct to my face. They would like gossip behind my back and then I'd walk into a room and everyone goes quiet. So it's typical, like it was like high school bullying. And um, and then at the same time, I didn't want to come across on TV like I'm this moany girl, like always yeah. upset all the time and always moaning about everything. So I kept everything in. And actually the producers told me after the show, they were like, you should have come to the diary room and spoke about more what was happening. You should have spoke about your feelings more than the audience would have known what you're feeling. But I didn't think of it from that way. I was just like, I just kept everything in. So yeah, that was quite difficult. Did that kind of remind you of your, your, your childhood and growing up? Yeah. Going through exactly the same experience. Exactly the same. 10 yeah. years later. Yeah. So again it was very controversial right from a race perspective mm. um even brought up in parliament was all mm. over the media but despite all those challenges you still got to the final yeah so i mean obviously that showed a lot of resilience from your part but by at that stage when you got to the final had that really affected your mental health a lot by that by that time yeah a lot and i didn't realize how much until i left the house um so when you leave the house the show doesn't really give you that much support they basically just give you a train ticket and that's it you really? go home yeah so um, imagine like from going from all that in the show and then obviously put your phone on and everyone knows who you are your social media is going off yeah. and then and then you've got that pressure as well everyone's like this is your time now you've come out the show you yeah. have to utilize it you have to work and then i've just gone back to i was still living in birmingham at that point and I've just come back and my mum's there and my mum's, um, she's an amazing person, but she's, she's, uh, I don't know how to explain it. She's, she's old and she's not so, um, she's not business minded. She's a very simple person. So, so I didn't have a lot of support around me. There wasn't anyone strong. It was quite a unique situation to be in. Yeah. I mean, you've alluded to the fact that, I, I mean, look, we've, obviously seen over the last two three years the effect of uh, on real I, I don't really want to use this word in relation to you because you've evolved from that but reality tv stars suffering from mental health issues and unfortunately there's been instances where people have taken their own lives mm. for really no fault of their own because of a situation that they've put in been yeah. put into um so you've you've kind of You've cut from my my perception. You've come out of a situation where you are literally in the spotlight to nothing. Then yeah. all of a sudden, there's this pressure on you that you know you've got a small window exactly yeah. to try and generate as much exposure and revenue. You know deep down it's not going to last forever. Yeah. You wish it will, but you know it won't. Exactly. Yeah. And then who's going to guide you to make the right decisions? Because yeah. there's almost that fear of loss as well, yeah. playing psychologically yeah. to say, well, okay, if I don't make the right move or if I don't go with the right deal, I'm going to miss out on X. Yeah. So. And also you've got it spot on there. You explained it perfectly. And then on top of that as well, you're seeing all the negative comments and, you know, people putting you down. And so I think, I thought I was quite a strong person, right? I thought I was prepared for all of it because people would say, you know, if you're going on to a reality TV show, you 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 have to expect all this. And I did. But, um, it, yeah, it actually really broke me after. So you've, you've come out and you're already in a dark place because of everything that you faced within there. How low did it get for you? 
so in the end like I kind of just gave up I thought I'd uh, first two weeks I tried to like keep up with the pace of what was happening in my life I'd like, jump on a train every day do interviews and but then I just felt it was so much like my mind was clogged up I didn't know what was happening I had no direction um there was no structure in my life it just everything just felt like a big mess so in the end I just thought you know what I give up and I stayed in my house for six months after and I didn't leave Wow. I just slept and ate, slept and eat, slept and eat. That was it. See, I can I can resonate with that. And mm. I think you can as well, Cork, because you've been in that situation. Because when you're in that when you're in that really dark place, you, you it's not that you don't have the motivation. Mm. There is kind of a little still a little burning desire, but you, you just can't find the direction for it. Yeah. And the best thing you feel is just to lock yourself away. I mean, I know I was weeks on end just just at home, yeah. curtains shut, didn't want to leave the bed. Um, life is still carrying on. I mean, in your instance, I can imagine all the media uh, attention, et cetera, et cetera. It's still carrying on, but yeah. you want to be left alone, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of being torn mm. in I was two also making a lot, I'm, I'm glad I took that time off though, because prior to that, I was making a lot of bad decisions as well. I was doing work that, if I was in my normal mind, I wouldn't have. In between, um, I ended up going to India. Uh, I think a month after the show as well, and I, I, I did a few movies. Well, I did a movie there that I would never have done if I was in my own really? mind, because I was like, no, I have to stay in the media. Yeah. I have to take this opportunity. Um, so I was making just a lot of bad decisions. Yeah. So, and so cause my mind wasn't in the right state. Not only are you being pulled left, right, and center. Not only do you want to be kind of and people are trying to take advantage of you as well yeah. mm. and then also, you know people presume that I made loads of money from it and um, there was a, quite a few con people that come into my life as well and, and they try to uh, take advantage so 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 it so was just it was, like so vultures as well around you I can imagine you leave the house yeah, yeah I can imagine so as much as as much as people sit there and think and again this comes back to exactly what we're trying to discuss is you look at the perception mm. but you don't necessarily know what's going behind this on behind the scenes so as much as people would look at you and think oh wow look she's got all this exposure she's 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 she's, she's m made it mm. but you're being pulled left right and center yeah and, and it was even dragged well. even further into that negative mindset. Yeah. And then also the friends that I had prior to the show that I thought would have supported me, they actually went against me. And people that I didn't know that well were supporting me. It was so strange. But but they were supporting you to take advantage of you? Um, like even stuff on social media, people that I didn't know that well were like, yeah, vote for Dina. Dina's yeah. doing great. But my friends that should have supported me went the opposite way. So you learn a lot. I think sometimes, you know, friends don't like to see their close ones doing too well well we covered this last <laughs> week right? well it's, uh, it's, it's <coughs> you're, you're the closest people to you are, are silent and it's the strangers that shout the loudest for exactly you, you know? yeah yeah so I, I, I completely understand that sentiment but <coughs> with going with what um, Shazada said about the whole perspective of things and and going and going deeper into that it just goes to show it's like it's, it's that I've seen it all over social media just be kind. You have no idea what mm. someone is going, what's, what's going through someone's Absolutely. head, and I think you're the prime example of that. Absolutely. Uh, and 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 to, to relate it back to what we are, the the value that we're giving to our viewers and, and people that listen to this, um, because I, we we've all made mistakes. I've made mistakes. There's going to be entrepreneurs that have listened to this who are um, haven't had that light bulb moment yet, and and they they might be self sabotaging themselves. Um, they might be making wrong decisions and they might be doing what your friends are doing and where they're successful mm -hmm. and uh, a, f a friend might be starting a business and they're like yeah, I, I don't really care you know as, as, as long as I'm good um, that's that's kind of the, the main the main thing I think there's another element here right is we get so caught up with what's going on around us and we get so caught up in other people's lives and the perception of other people's lives, we take our eye off the actual journey, mm -hmm. right? It's very easy to sit there and say, I wanna be like that. And this, we said this before, I wanna be like that. Oh, look at her life or look at his life, I want that. But actually what you are potentially doing as an entrepreneur may excel what that person is going through 
from a, a negative mindset, from a depression perspective, from an anxiety perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like you say, you know, be kind. You don't know what other people are going through. Equally, don't compare. Everybody has their own journeys, right? Yeah. And at the end of the day, as much as somebody, you know how we talked about, we think entrepreneurship is a, bi- a million dollars in a Ferrari, right? And then we touched on the fact that you've created a product and service, you've taken it to market, that in itself is an amazing achievement. Is, yeah. You don't necessarily have to hit the highs of stardom or, or celebrity to achieve success. If somebody's opened up a shop down the road and mm-hmm. the first clients walked in, wow. Yeah, definitely. That, that yes. should be something that people should be proud of instead mm-hmm. of looking around and seeing, you know, last week uh, we touched on choosing your role models, right? Now, Dina, obviously you're a role model to a lot of people. And I think even more so because of the journey that you've been through. I mean, everything that you've achieved, you've done off your own back, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's no difference. I see no difference between what you've achieved and the struggles that you've gone through and and, 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 and an entrepreneur on a daily basis that has to go through those challenges. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you when you were going through those 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 deep and those dark moments, um, obviously not leaving your house for six months what was the catalyst what made you turn around and think I- i've got to break this I- I've-, I've got to do something about this what's the step that i take i still remember a day um i woke up and i was thinking to myself like you know it's not it, this is just not good enough now you need to do something you need to sort out yourself and i stepped on the scale and I'd gained like three stone. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I looked in the mirror, I'm like, wow, I'm a mess. And I, I don't know, something just clicked and I thought, no, I need to sort myself out now and, and just and just change things. So what did, what did I, you I, do? I, I don't know what clicked inside me. Yeah. It was just one day. I still remember that day it happened. What what changed after that then? So you said you needed a change. What, 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 I want to know what the first change you did. Obviously, so obviously. first thing I got a pen and paper and I made a plan, I wrote everything down that I need to do to get to a place where I want to be in like two, three years. And then join the gym, start getting back into shape. And um, in my plan, I realized that I had to go back to India to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Um, I, what, what was it What was it that you specifically wanted to achieve that you felt that would, you could I get th- I, I, th- I realized at that point, I needed to be more financially secure. Um, I needed to, um, I wanted to buy a, a better house in London. I didn't want to be in Birmingham because yeah. nothing wrong with Birmingham, but I knew there was no opportunities, more, more opportunities for me there. Yeah. And I realized that um, for me to make the amount that I needed to make, I needed to be in India. I wouldn't have been able to make that in England. Um, and then also I did want to continue like the acting and the TV work. So I just felt like m- my opportunities is going to be in India. So, um, yeah, I took that step again, flew out to India and I moved to Mumbai and just started getting on with my life again there. So it's it's interesting because a lot of the time when people go through those dark phases and they're in those dark places, they kind of think, well, okay, <clears throat> there's only two ways out of this for me. Mm-hmm. One is medication, right? When we're yeah. suffering from depression, we, we, we tend to go down that route. The other is therapy. Therapy, we know we've talked about it a number of times. People feel very, very afraid about going to a therapist, etc. But you've just proved, right, that as long as you take that first step, mm-hmm. whether it's physical fitness, whether it's training, whether it's therapy, whatever that step is, you're going through this dark phase. Other people are going through exactly the same thing that you're going through. It's just taking that first mm-hmm. step, regardless of what it is. In your case, it was the physical aspect. No, I think it's you have to have a light at the end of a tunnel. You have yeah. to have something that makes your soul happy, something to aim towards. So then you know, you know, this is not life. This is this, there's more to life. You know, maybe it could be that someone wants to travel to a place that they've never been before. So write it down on the paper and work out how you can get to that place. Nothing's impossible. Yeah. It's about having an aim and having that drive to do something for yourself and i think that's what can help you get out of depression yeah. is having a goal and being excited about something well goals are really important 
I yeah. mean, without goals, what are we trying to achieve in life, right? And I know that sounds quite a sweeping statement, but ultimately, if you don't have goals and mm -hmm. things that you want to achieve, then what actually are you working yeah. towards? And it's, it's not just, um, it shouldn't just be about money or being no, rich or being exactly. famous. Yeah. You know, you can have goals. F for me, actually, none of this stuff is that important now. Yeah. The most important thing for me now is to be around good people, that my soul is happy, that I'm happy. Everything else is secondary. Um, so yeah. So uh, you you've you've obviously you've gone to India. You've taken this step, and you're starting to see yourself come out of this 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 dark like, place. It's difficult as well, you know, moving to India by myself, yeah. not knowing the language. I don't yeah. know that many people out there, so th that was a very very because difficult again, task people again. might perceive that you had connections in India. Yeah. You were you know kind of who you knew out there but it wasn't was it it no, was I, literally you off your own back yeah, on anyone. your own out mm -hmm. there setting yourself up i literally I, I went out there for the first time to shoot a music video so i knew like the singer of the video and a bit a little bit of the production team but that was it i didn't yeah. know anyone there unreal so, unreal yeah. and, and that's kind of a theme in your life isn't it mm. really is whatever you've done you've done off your own back nobody's helped yeah. you you've achieved everything that you've achieved mm -hmm by just keeping on, keep by, by pushing forward constantly. Yeah. And do you think goal setting played a really important part in that? It did, I think every second day I'm, I've got a pen and paper out and writing the new goals yeah. and, and that would excite me, that would get me out of my depression as well. Every time you achieve a new milestone or you hit a goal, it makes you happy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And they don't necessarily be, have to be massive goals. No. It's like small steps. I've always small believed steps. in that. I think sometimes if you set a goal that is too high okay i understand people say nothing's too high yeah. but you have to be realistic yeah. in life sometime and i think that's very important i've seen a lot of people actually that move to india and they've got their goals and aims so high and then when they don't reach it they go into depression yeah. so for me it's important that you make realistic goals or you have a set you have a, a plan to reach there because if you aim for something so high and then you don't have a proper plan to get there and you don't reach it, it is going to affect you. Of course it is. But this yeah. is, you've touched on it, right? It's, it's having that plan to get there step by step. And Courtney, this kind of links back to, to what you do, right? Because when you've got people coming on uh, your fitness training programs, they know what they want to achieve, what the end goal is. And it, in that kind of area, it's very, it can be very, you can be very easily swayed off course if you don't see tangible physical results. Yeah. So when you're goal setting, how do you get people to kind of take those small steps moving forward? I mean, what Dina's already said, it's there has to be a, a, a plan in place. I want to lose 10 kilos. OK, how are we going to lose these 10 kilos? OK, there's got to be small, tiny step ons in between. So we're going to do this amount of steps a day. We're going to eat this amount of food. We're going to, the training frequency is going to be three to four times a week, whatever it may be reference it in an on, entrepreneurship way i, I want to earn a million pounds okay how are you going to do it what are you going to do it in are you going to what, what's your what's your what's your business plan mm -hmm. etc all, all these things moving to Mom, mumbai one thing that has been um as a, a pattern i've noticed um in dina's behavior since she has grown up is the or attribute should i say is the the discipline which yeah. we haven't touched on and the resilience and, and the resilience mm. and i and i loved it uh, as soon as i saw the the karate background i thought that that's gonna <laughs> be for, for me i think that's I, I i mean correct me if i'm wrong i think that's probably one a, a big catalyst for you as to what what has um built the discipline mm. up for you because it's yeah. you travel like you could you, you fought you fight people yeah. you know yeah, that's yeah. what you that's what you do um and so you're, you're a fighter you know so your your journey so far and and this is this is what is 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 key <coughs> perspective so uh someone brand new is going to come to your instagram oh my god this beautiful woman she's got half a million followers she she does this 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 and this and this um i'd like to achieve um what she's achieved mm -hmm. okay cool do you want to deal with depression do you want to do having no support do you want to deal with racism um do you want to deal with uh, so many other things because yeah. yeah. that's what you'll have to do in order to get there i think instagram as well it's very um yeah, you, you can't believe what you see on Instagram. For me personally, I it's kind of like a hobby. I enjoy going to nice places, taking a nice photo, doing a little bit of editing, uploading it, getting yeah. it. I, I don't see it as, um, people think I do it like for my career, but actually it's just a hobby. I just yeah. enjoy uploading nice photos. But what I didn't think about is that 
the image that I'm portraying of myself um, is probably not really showing who I really am. That's right. All and that's why Instagram gets confusing. You know, do you use it as to show people who you are? Do you just use it for photos? Like, it's, it's confusing, isn't it? It is, and it is confusing. And, and, and again, this is one of the reasons why, you know, t today's podcast is, is, is quite important because we can get caught up in the facade mm -hmm. of what people want to present. You know, again, Instagram shows us that an entrepreneur is this or someone successful lives this kind of life. But success is relative. Successive, success is not objective, it's subjective. Yeah. What, you know, let's say for example, a car mechanic, right? He's got two ramps. He t ends up getting three ramps. He's able to bring in more revenue. That's success. But yeah, it is. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. we really have to try and redefine what success is for individuals. Yeah. Because coming back to your story, Dina, as much as there are glamorous aspects of it, you've put in the grind. Mm. You've been in those dark places. You've not had the support. We were having a conversation earlier on about a mutual friend of ours when she first met you and she thought that you came from money and that your life was all made, yeah. placed in front of you, this kind of golden brick road that you were traveling down. But the reality is you've created everything yourself. You've mm -hmm. done this yourself and you've gone through the same challenges that anybody would, would, yeah. would go through. Um, and it's kind of... I think what we want people to understand is, regardless of your profile, you're just a normal human being that faces exactly, has faced exactly the same challenges and taken that step to move forward. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, you know, I think I'm a very simple person. Like every day I'm, I'm, I'm in my trackies, I'm in my trainers. Well, you're, you're really down I don't to even, earth. Yeah. I don't even like wearing makeup that much. Yeah. But I was looking at my Instagram the other day and I thought if someone doesn't know me and they're saying my Instagram compared to who I really am, I think it's uh, it's, a it's huge not disparity. really showing who huge I am. Huge disparity. Yeah. Because obviously having to spend time with you, yeah. you know, hanging out with you, it's like, okay, there there are there are two completely different people here. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and again, people get caught up in that perception, um, and it's something that we need to kind of address and break and start a conversation on because, again, success success is relative. You, you can't compare yourself or your situation to somebody else's situation mm -hmm. that's not how life works you've got to stick to your own path you know what i mean um and it's very i think that's another thing as well that i've learned that um when you want to do something in life it's very important to stick to your own morals yes. and, and do with what do yeah. what your heart says don't get swayed by other people's opinions or what yeah. other people think you should do um, I did used to when I was younger and I made a lot of bad decisions in my career and I look back at some of the work I've done and I'm like, Dina, why would you do that? Yeah. Um, but now I've just learned that even if a hundred people are telling you to do something, if your heart tells you not to do it, you go with what your heart says. A lot of people would argue that because you're in that privileged position, you're able to do that right now. But I actually think that no, that's, um, that's not the case. I mm -hmm. think that's the mentality that a lot of people need to have is, you know, if it doesn't feel right, yeah, then analyze it. You know how we always said adjust, adapt, and evolve, whether it's your product, your service, your persona, whatever mm -hmm. it is, we've got to constantly be analyzing and, and, and kind of mm -hmm. really addressing things for what they actually are, not what they're perceived to be. You know when my life actually really changed thinking about it, um, so I did a few more reality TV shows in India. I did Fear Factor yeah. and um, acted in a few Punjabi films. But I was still like, my soul wasn't happy. And I, I felt like what potential I have to do wasn't being utilized. Just going through the and, motions. Uh, so I woke up one day and I thought, you know what? I'm going to change. I'm going to, I, right now, what's going well for me is my businesses that I'm doing in India. To be honest with you, the acting doing a few films here and there people that don't know much about the industry might think i'm doing well but yeah. i knew professionally it wasn't that great mm. but my businesses was going well so i decided you know what i'm not going to concentrate on my acting anymore i'm i'm going to concentrate on my uh, businesses and when i made that decision my my life actually changed for the better and a lot of people thought i was silly for making that yeah. decision but um, i'm glad i listened to myself and was that I went because down the businesses route. were a lot more tangible than the acting which is slightly superficial 
yeah there's that and then um, I wasn't getting roles that I thought I was suited to you know you you go and you act on a film and a lot of the crew that I was working with they, they wasn't even disciplined they mm. wasn't their, their mind wasn't focused on the film and if you have a bad director or a bad producer the actor looks bad on TV yeah. because it, it, it's you need a whole team to make a good product so I'm like you know what the work I'm doing now it's it's not all in my hands I'm working with stupid people that are making you look you, bad you're a commodity basically yeah, yeah. and uh, i just felt i'm worth more than this so i changed my life concentrated on my uh, businesses more i uh, moved back to london i did a course in directing and filmmaking i went into directing um then i made a big choice and uh, chose to make my own film my own documentary about something i was passionate about and that was the best decision i ever made well we're gonna to change we're gonna, my life we're gonna yeah. touch on this actually because it's india's forgotten people which has been your kind of labour of love and you filmed it over a year and you produced it, directed it, hosted it yourself. Yeah. Would you say that at that point when you were going through, it must have been a challenge and we'll go into how much of a challenge it was, do you think that was your, your liberation from everything to be able to do what you wanted to do at that moment in time? So... I real I've realized going through life that wherever I'm successful, it's where um, everything's in my hands. Where yeah. I've, I've learned that never to rely on anyone. You can take people's help, you can take people's advice, but you should never put your power in anyone else's hands. So with this film, I realized you know what, it's success is all down to me because I'm producing it, so I'm down to shooting it and releasing it. I'm hosting it, so how it comes across on camera, it's all in my hands. I'm directing it, so how it's shot, it's all in my hands. So I took on a lot, but um, I was happy to do it because I just wanted to have the um, control over my project. How many years after your depression did you film India's Forgotten People or, or, or start that project? A uh, long time, so uh, nine years. And do you think that your road your road to recovery that was the pinnacle no the pinnacle was when i decided to change my career route when i stopped concentrating on acting in india and i concentrated more on my businesses right. because i had to really be honest with myself and i think it's hard to be honest with yourself yeah. sometimes sometimes you have a goal and you have so you have a dream but if, if, it's, if it's not going well you have to change paths and i think that's really really important to do in life if something's not yeah, working that's right you have to be brave with yourself and think it's not working, do something else. And um, I've seen, I've got a lot of friends actually that live in India that have not managed to do that. And they've been in India for like 10, 15 years and they still have that dream of being a big actor, but it's not happening mm -hmm. and they've wasted like half their life. So I think it's really important sometimes to realize what's working and what's not. And, 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 and it's sad actually. It's, it's a little bit sad when you kind of have to give up on your dream you've got to take then a you step have to back. create a new dream yeah you've got to take a step back and again you know you've got to kind of adjust to what's going on around you a lot of the time and and we've kind of touched on this before as well is you've you've got to you've got to i think you've got to have a some kind of support network around you mm -hmm. to be able to make those decisions to turn around and say okay look this product or service isn't working or this road that you're going down isn't working mm -hmm. um and a lot of people struggle to reach out slightly uh, slightly because of the fact that you don't want to be seen as a failure yeah and you can become so compartmentalized in that that oh, i've got to do this i've got to make it work how am i going to show my face if this doesn't work and out because of that i was making a lot of bad decisions mm. prior doing films that I shouldn't have done, doing shoots that I, that I just shouldn't have done. It wasn't worth it yeah. because I wanted to show people that I'm working. And even to this day, um, there are people that say, oh, you know, what were you doing out in India for 10 years? You didn't, you could have, should, should have done a film of Salman Khan. You, yeah, should, yeah. you should have been the next Katrina KF. And people don't think when they say that. No. Like, you know how many thousands of people yeah. go to India every exactly. year to try to make it and the small percentage of people that actually make it. And, and that's, I mean, if some, somebody says that to you, that must have a little knock-on effect on your self-confident probably not now as you're yeah. probably a lot more resilient yeah, but, but back at the then time it did. so the moment where you kind of realigned and reframed your thinking the moment that you said was your pinnacle was refocusing on your businesses mm -hmm. um and you have very successful businesses in india at the moment and abroad so do you want to touch on those let the people know exactly what you what you do outside of 
Um, yeah, so there's a few businesses out there. Like one of them, I've got um, clinics. We do hair transplants. Um, one of the main things I'm working on now is a charity that I set up in Jaipur called Kindness Diaries Trust. Um, I've got my production company out there as well where we make content. Um, but a lot of my time right now is going on the charity that I set up. So when I moved out to India, um, obviously it was really shocking for the first time seeing all the poverty around yeah. you. And um, it's a lot to deal with seeing it every day. But then living there for 10 years, you kind of become immune to it. You become used to seeing people yeah. living on the streets and you, you become used to seeing people begging around you because you're there every day. But then I started um, learning, like, why are people living like this? Like India's economy is doing so well. Yeah. Why, why are people still living like this today? It's, it's shocking. Um, so I started doing little bits of charity here and there. I'd go out in the evenings, give out food and meet the people and speak to people on the streets. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to do more one day. Um, so I, I, I believe that, you know, you have to help yourself in life first before you can really dedicate a lot of time to helping other people. So when I felt like I was at the right point in my life where I'm feeling stable, I'm feeling happy, I'm feeling secure, I've actually got time now that I can dedicate to other things. That's when I went about registering my charity, Kindness Diaries Trust. Um, just registering the charity was really difficult in India because there's so much paperwork you have yeah. to go through and stuff. So it took like a year to register it. But we did that. It's been um, almost a year and a half now. It's been going really well. We've got an office in Jaipur in Rajasthan. Um, we do food distributions every day. We give a lot of the kids free education. We've set up um, a small camp so people can go there and do their get their tutoring sessions. Um, during COVID this time, we flew out a lot of oxygen machines from Dubai to Mumbai. Um, so yeah, it's been going really well and I'm enjoying it. So that, that kind of charitable nature that you have and creating um, your charity and the work that you do. And again, I know it's all altruistic and you're, you're, you're a very giving person. Does that help towards your recovery though? It does actually it makes me feel good when you know, mm. I'm doing charity and I say it's some I think a lot of people do charity as well because of the feeling that it gives you is it so, is it right to say that doing charity is selfish in a way because it, what's it, the right word for it, it will, you do charity because it makes you feel good it makes you feel good right yeah. so I mean, they, they say helping others is a form of recovery in itself yeah right um, and that sense of giving and not wanting back mm -hmm. is really actually a really deep rooted human mm. instinct that I think we've kind of lost along the way. And when you link that back to kind of mental health issues, I think it's so easy to internalize things and not think actually, do you know what? I can share my experiences with somebody else. Yeah. It might help somebody else or going even deeper that how you've gone mm -hmm. with, with, with your charity and helping children that are disadvantaged. For me, I love me meeting like young girls or young females and when they don't have a lot of support yeah. and I can just guide them and give them guidance that I wish someone gave me. Yeah. And I've done it to a lot of um, girls. I've helped them move to the city. I've given them advice, taught them a lot. and. They come back after like a year or two and they thank me and they're like, you know, we've bought our mom a car. We've just bought our first wow. house and they've come from really small villages. Yeah. And that's like a really nice feeling. It's actually. just pride in that, right? Yeah. And there's yeah. nothing wrong in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, or giving to charity, obviously, we, we do it without kind of expecting anything back. But emotionally, there's mm -hmm. the, it kind of fills a void yeah. that I, I, the other things probably wouldn't fill. You know what I mean? I, I mean, you've seen it all, though, right? Huh? I think I, th I think we do. Like, you, you, we say we're doing it to, to not gain anything back, but like, mm. you are. It's we, we get, we're gaining so much back. We're gaining a feeling. We're gaining a. I think what it is a, a sense of purpose and and meaning. From from what what you've just said, the the girls that you were speaking to, you you were those girls. You know, yeah. I was thinking that actually when you when, yeah. you when you were saying it, yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you are now giving back what you did, what you weren't able to receive. Yeah, and, and so yeah. It, it's kind of like uh, you're living vicariously through them in 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 a way, um, mm. which which I think is amazing. It's funny. I um, one of, after one of our podcasts the other day, um, I was walking to the train station, and um, some black uh, some young uh, black guys from a college were were doing some charity work there, 
and I've done that job before and normally I'd be like, ah oh, man, I don't want to speak to these guys. But where you made yourself a priority, you are now ma able, you're in a better position to make others a priority. Mm. And that's exa and I thought, do you know what? I was like, no, I, I do have time to speak to these and I do have some money to spare. So yeah. do you know what? Help, I think for me as want. well now, I, I don't like to, um, even though the food distributions is helping them day by day, but it's not really making them independent so my main aim for this charity is to give people independence teach them how to work teach them how to do things for themselves so they're not relying on a charity or relying on other things it's very important to make someone independent so they can survive by themselves yeah absolutely yeah. and i mean that's one of the greatest gifts you can give anybody right yeah so despite your journey which obviously we've we've gone into you're in a situation right now where you know it's you're able to give back. Your mental health is in a in a in a decent place. Mm -hmm. You've overcome those challenges. The sad fact is that you've overcome those challenges yourself. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be in a similar position that could potentially take some kind of solace in the fact that if you if you can fight enough, there is always a way out. You For me, know? I think um, I've always been I've always believed in God. Yeah. And when I feel sad and alone, it, I always think, you know, I was born alone. I'm going to die alone. Yeah. The most important thing is my relationship with God. Yeah. And that really um, helps me through a lot. I, th I think spirituality does play, uh, can play a massive part. <clears throat> it has um, for me, like, no one, from a young age, no one ever told me to be religious. Um, there was no one around me that was religious. But I used to love going to the temple, to the Godwara, even when I was, whenever I'd feel sad and when I moved to Birmingham because there was a lot of temples around there. I would sit in the Godwara for hours by myself and right. that would make me feel better. Yeah. But um, when I look back on it, it's strange because there was no one around me that mm. was religious or told me to do that. But it was just... A natural what? inclination yeah. to, to go and do that. I mean, obviously, you know, people that can be agnostic, yeah. atheists, whatever there is always going to be something mm -hmm. that is going to resonate with you in a deeper sense, whether that's religion, spirituality, charitable causes. Yeah. You know, we've just got to find what fills that gap. And by setting goals and trying to achieve those goals, you're going to find that on your journey. You've just got to take that first step. And when mm. things get dark, you know there's always going to be a way out. Yeah. Um, so your documentary. Let's touch on that. Mm -hmm. um, so India's Forgotten People. Again, something you've done off your own back, um, which you obviously must be very, very proud of. Do you want to give us a bit of a background as to why you did it and what it's about? So um, during my time in India, I always got um, took to Rajasthan for um, a few films that I shot and a lot of my work kept taking me back to Rajasthan. So um, I've, I've, got, I've got a lot of friends there, really, really good friends actually in, Rajas in Jaipur. Um, so while I was shooting there, you'd see different kind of castes and tribes yeah. that are living there outside of the city. And I always found it very interesting. So when I made that decision, I wanted to make a documentary. I was just speaking with my friends in Jaipur and I was like, tell me something really interesting about Rajasthan or tell me something that I don't know. And then they told me about this nomadic tribe that's that lives around Rajasthan, that they live on carts and they have no house. Um, they live like people used to live centuries ago. So like a nomadic e existence. Yeah, completely yeah. nomadic. Um, and so I was like, okay, let's find out more. Maybe this is something we can um, shoot on. So in the city, I was warned against not meeting these people. They have a reputation of being very dangerous. That there's a high crime rate. Um, and just that, yeah, like it's not a good idea for yeah. me to go near them. They have a bad reputation. They don't like communicating with anyone outside of their uh, tribe. Um, you could, you'd probably get killed. Wow. So, you know, I was just really like, so was it you and, it you and your team, basically three, four people? Yes. Yeah, so I don't know. My gut told me not to listen to anyone and just try yeah. and meet a few of these people and see what they're like. So I went there with my small team, just me, um, Akbar. Uh, he's like my uh, right hand guy that does yeah. everything, travels with me and stuff. Um, the cameraman and the translator. Wow. So we just got in a small little car. We went out and we drove maybe like three hours out of Jaipur um, and we found these people and then we started talking to them and it took a long time to make them trust us so yeah. we could film them. The whole process of making this community open up to us and talk to us took about two and a half months. Wow. So it was constant visits there, 
you know spending time with them making them feel comfortable feeding them like so as we gained their trust and we discovered more we found out that they have a really unique and interesting history so um we would delve deeper into that and talked about that and then i saw how they don't get any help from the government at all so we even went and uh, interviewed top politicians in the area and ministers to find out what's happening and why they're being left out was there like a massive they... stigma with these guys um they're just because they're nomadic they don't have any identification they don't have passport they don't have any identification cards so how so the government just kind of leaves them out yeah. and that's why i named them india's forgotten people right. because they had they were so high up centuries ago um and now they're just basically doing nothing yeah, moving yeah. on a car traveling around and no one knows who they are and even though they have such a bad reputation they were actually some of the kindest nicest people that i've met in my life and even though they have nothing they're so in the end they were so welcoming with me um so friendly and they were actually happy with nothing yeah. even though they have no the, the, what they, they, a great they, lesson for life yeah, as well right they have really strong family mm. morals um they're very caring towards each other um they've always got smiles on their face they're always happy but they don't have anything yeah so but I really wanted to get that across. They have everything, though. Yeah. Because they have happiness. Exactly. And, and this yeah. is what I think is brilliant is, again, perspective has been the the main anchor around everything you've said so far today. Don't go. They're horrible. The crime rate, you might end up dead. And you literally said the complete opposite from mm. what your experience has been when you were, were, were with these people. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is amazing. So I, I really, that's what I wanted to get across in the film. Um, I was actually going to call the film a different title first. I was going to title it maybe like happiness with nothing yeah um but that's what i wanted to get across that even though you don't have anything but you can still be happy yeah, yeah. and, this and i want to create awareness for the community as well i hope that this film will um make people aware of them and hopefully that can create a change and they can get some help well it's been received really really well hasn't it i mean mm -hmm. wasn't it recently netflix so uh, it's going to be on yeah, so being a first-time filmmaker, I didn't expect it to go on such big channels. Yeah. I thought maybe some local channels around the world would buy it, but so far we've sold it to um, amazing channels in like Germany, Austria. We've just got a Netflix deal, so it's going to be shown on Netflix next year, which I never would have expected yeah. ever. Um, National Geo's taken it, Discovery Channel in Asia's taken it, so um, it's done really well. So, yeah. What a journey. Yeah. What a journey. I mean, you've painted the most amazing picture of your life away from the perception that people would potentially have. Yeah. Humble beginnings, hard graft, been in that dark place, and now you're in a situation where you've created something that mm. can be viewed all around the world yeah. and has a really strong message. So, Dina, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis to, I guess, keep that balance in your life? You know, high-performance woman, but you, you're going to need some downtime as well. So what do you do to keep your mental health in check? I think the most important thing for me to keep my mental health in check is finding that balance. Um, you know, you, you can't put too much time in work and not enough time in activities that you enjoy and at the same time you shouldn't take too much time out and not work it's all about finding the balance so um um i do a lot of yoga um i, I love going to the gym i run a lot um i really enjoy editing so, so, so a lot of time my friends just send me their photos and i edit it for, <laughs> edit it for them it's like my stress <laughs> release even just taking time out and watching netflix and just just yeah. relaxing your mind um so yeah it's just about finding the balance i think that's the main thing so the physical element obviously plays a massive part for you in finding that balance yeah and keeping your mental health in check mm -hmm. but you've obviously been through a hell of a journey and it's a hell of a story so thank you so much for coming on and sharing um i think it's going to be very very important for people to see that you know you can't always judge a book by its co yeah. by its cover in fact you can't judge by the facade that's presented or the perception that no. you get that we all need to be our own individual selves and stay on our own roads and our own journey and just focus on what our successes are however small or big mm -hmm. they can be and i think in conclusion goal setting is actually a really really important part of of yeah. moving forward and, and and trying to overcome your challenges what do you think Courtney? 
I, I think you, you got it there. What I would like to finish on is in a nutshell, what is the best piece of advice you could give to any of our listeners here today? Oh, put me on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I th- um, as I mentioned before, the, the, the hardest lesson I've learned in life um, is that you have to be independent. Um, don't rely on anyone else for your success or for your happiness. Just always keep yourself in check and, and do everything yourself. Be independent. <laughs> and equally, I think another lesson to be learned from your story is that when you are going through those down moments, when you're in that mire, when you're in that darkness, you've got to take that first step, no matter Mm -hmm. what that looks like. You've got to take that first step. Yeah. I think, um, you know, other people can try and help you, but if you don't want to help yourself, nothing is going to happen. So that's when it comes back to being independent. You can go to counselling. and I'm sure it does help and you can have so many people around you saying you know you need to do this you need to sort out your life but if you don't want to do it yourself it's not going to happen i think you touched on something before i think you you were talking about it in more of a spiritual aspect right but it's whatever resonates with you at that moment in time that you can find some kind of solace in you know whether that's starting a fitness fitness journey or even just going to a yoga class Mm -hmm. and just taking that step to try and change that change your life of where you are at that moment in time do you know what i mean and i think that's really really important really important guys that was episode four of our leaving minds podcast i want to say a humongous thank you for dina coming massive in. thank you Dina. The story thank was inspirational <laughs> and i'm sure it's going to resonate with um every single person out there um and the key fundamentals i think to take from your story is be disciplined have structure to your goals and make sure that you are independent and you're not relying on anyone else for your success or your happiness absolutely absolutely